Good morning, everyone. Kevin here from Skywatcher. I'm hoping the delay is fixed. It looks like I might still have it with this main camera and my audio. So we've been working on it all morning, and we'll have to mess with it if it doesn't look like it's 100% synced. It looks okay. Um, welcome to the What's Up webcast. My name is Kevin Lagore. Uh, we do this every Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific, right here at the Skywatcher USA YouTube channel. We cover everything from what's up in the nighttime sky to equipment to helpful tips and tricks. And uh, at the end of the month, we have a special guest on to talk about their specialty in the field of astronomy. Now, this month, of course, is the lead up to the 2024 eclipse. That is on April 8th. We are only a handful of weeks away. Um, three weeks, essentially. Um, so this whole month is basically ramping up to that. We've gotten a ton of questions um, on all of our solar episodes leading up to uh, the past eclipses, and there's been a lot of questions about what filters to use and so on and so forth. So this whole month is basically dedicated to the sun and how to prep for that. Now, um, before we bring our guest in today, if you want to go ahead and support the channel, please go ahead and subscribe, leave a like on a video. Um, it's uh, really important to you know, definitely let us know that we're doing a good job. So please subscribe. We know a good portion of you are uh, not subscribed. So please go ahead and do that. Uh, if you want to support the channel, you can go over to skywatcher.threadless.com, which you see right up here. You can pick some cool swag, shirts, all kinds of stuff. That also goes to supporting our channel. Now, other stuff that's going on, we have the limited edition Silver Anniversary Virtuoso GTI. These are available in shipping. Um, you can either check with your favorite dealer or you can just head over to our website and just click the banner. Um, oh, it looks like our, our warehouse might be out because if it doesn't say put in cart, that means we're out of them. We have another shipment in a few months, but we do know some dealers who have them, so check around um, if you'd like to get one of those. Uh, with the eclipse coming up on April 8th, we will be at the Texas Star Party event, um, the Texas Star Party Solar Eclipse event. Um, if you want to go to texasstarparty.org um, and see what's available, I don't know what else is available there. Uh, here it is right here. Um, oh, that's the May event. Anyway, here we go. Here's the solar eclipse thing. I don't know why there's a UFO and a cow being lifted up by it, but I didn't create the banner, so whatever. So there's an alien right there, too. It could be really interesting at the Texas event, but we'll be there. Um, we've got a ton of cool stuff that we're bringing for you guys to see. Um, lots of hardware. So if you're going to be there, stop by, say hi. We'll be there the whole week, the all four days of the event. Um, so uh, stop by, say hi. We've got some door prizes heading out there and a lot of solar equipment Um to showcase some of our stuff. So that's where we'll be, um, and it should be kind of fun. All right, so let's get started. We have Simon Tang, who is back with us. There's Simon up there in the corner. Hi, Simon. Um, all of you know Simon. He's been on several times. He's kind of our lead uh, solar imager specialist, um, and he knows just about everything you need to know uh, about the sun, and that's why he is uh, on with us. So good morning, Simon morning and good afternoon good evening for everybody else who is not here in the u.s yes and this is a uh live episode but if this is all pre-recorded so if you didn't have a chance to catch it live you can always go back just like all of our other episodes wait this is live yep yeah the cat we pre-recorded this yes. is no i'm, I'm kidding <laughs> uh simon does okay. have a cat so it might make a uh appearance timing. through the video so just FYI. well she's she's actually right she's on my lap right now okay. so she yep. she'll she'll jump up jump up and meow at me or Sun bite my cat. arm it's one or the other yes <clears throat> okay um i'm gonna go through a couple of things and we're pretty much gonna open it up for questions so it'll be a very very short presentation um although somebody already asked a question right off the bat kevin uh, yeah, there so is a question before this, uh, the show gets started. I know Prima Luchu makes a specific power cord for my mount, CQ350. Is it recommended to power it from the from an eagle? Um, well, our mounts are normally three to four amps, so you could power it through the eagle, um, but you're going to need to have the eagle's larger power supply um, that they make. I, 
I don't know if it's like, was it 14, 15 amps? Simon? Yeah, it's 14, 14 amps. <clears throat> I get all my Prima Lucha stuff usually from Simon. Um, or I just go direct to Tom. It's a Bramwell. Keep in mind, though, I will say this. It's it's a 14 amp peak power supply, roughly 7 to 8 amps on just regular usage. So you do have to be mindful uh, using th those power supplies. Because yeah. a lot of people don't realize this. Power supplies say XYZ number. Usually it's peak performance, not continuous usage. Just be careful with that. Yeah, any... I don't run my mounts off of the Eagles. Um, they are generally run off of their own power supplies. Um, because by the time you throw a camera and a filter wheel, and God forbid we talk about dew heaters, um, yep. you're done. You've already <laughs> maximized the whole thing, especially if you've got dew heaters involved. So I usually recommend, unless it's under some specific scenario, I never run my mounts off of the, the uh, Prima Lucha Eagles. Even our uh, main mounts at our remote observatory, the Eagle does not handle the power for those. Um, they're on a separate, um, they're on an ethernet power based power switch. Um, so we can shut the, forgot what they're called exactly, but it's a, it's a set of AC power plugs and we can turn that off remotely um, on its own. But the Eagle has nothing to do with the power of the mount. It just has the USB to, control connection but i would not advise powering anything through these little computers just because you're gonna burn through the rest of it really quick so but yes there is a connector for it so and if you're gonna do it just be mindful so yes because okay. if you do low power on our mounts that will barbecue the motorboard so <clears throat> yes and then i'll be replacing them as usual Yes. Yeah, so back to our in the field correspondent, Simon. <laughs> okay. So um, what I'm going to talk about since this is solar eclipse related is we've noticed there's a huge mixed bag of people buying different uh, types of filters. Mm -hmm. And I think I've noticed there has been a huge uptick this year for people buying hydrogen alpha solar telescopes. Yeah. Now, we all know what the H-Alpha scopes look like, but most of us, if you're new to all of this, don't actually know what the colors or what to expect from all the other filters. So right now I have on this image is a calcium K image that I took uh, quite a while ago now, and it's been processed, obviously. And the most important thing is a lot of people don't realize this, but in calcium K, you can actually see provenances and I can actually zoom into them and you'll see like just tiny, tiny little wisps <laughs> here and there. And usually it's the really bright ones that show up incredibly well. Uh, you know, you can kind of detect them all over the place. So it's one of these things that you kind of don't want to disregard when you're doing the solar eclipse is to look at it in different bands. Now, what if I'm using a bunch of white light solar filters? What do those look like? So I kind of looked through um, a really neat website. Um, I've got the name of the website now, so I'm just going to cheat and go to it right now. Amazing Sky by Alan Dyer. Okay. And this is a bit of a plug because he has this great PDF series on how to photograph the solar eclipses. And he's obviously referring to 2023 and 2024. And I really, really recommend you buy this. Uh, it's like 10 bucks. 12 bucks or something like that, depending on where you are. And this gives you all the information you could ever think about when it comes down to doing the eclipse, the type of filters, um, the duration to composites, time lapses, oh, you name it, it's all in here. But what I wanted to pull out from this particular um, book was the different types of filters that you could possibly get. Yeah, this now, is a big big question <clears throat> uh -oh. what's the big big question oh no like i this is a actually right here is a really good spread of information because this is something that we don't really get to see much by divulging not that's a secret but there is variation between the types of white light filters so. oh yeah totally the only thing that i've uh i um i haven't included on here but i'll give you an example in a second is the Herschel wedges, because they are very, very different. 
Yeah. So let's just go through the uh, common filters that you put on the front, starting with the Bada or Kendrick, whichever way you want to call them, Mylar filters that you can either have pre-made or you make it yourself and stick it in front of your scope and all that kind of good stuff. And what it does is it gives you this interesting, like weird brownish tinge to the sun. Now, of course, this is going to be subjective based upon what your white balance is. So if you have auto white balancing on your camera, it'll do its best and it will just turn this image into this weird white looking sun, which, you know, oddly enough, that really is the color of the sun. It's really white. You know, it's not weird tints of some other color. Now, if you have one of the older Thousand Oaks uh, glass solar filters, you'll get this really nice warm orangey color. Usually when I process my images, which you'll see in a second, um, you kind of get a similar effect to this because this is kind of where I started off from what I remember in my head. And ever since then, that's what I've been processing. Now, the new Thousand Oaks uh, filters that you've probably been picking up if you haven't already got them, use something called solar light. Uh, recently, there was a shortage of this stuff. So uh, Thousand Oaks have been scrambling to get all the inventory back together again. Uh, where I work, uh, it's just mayhem. It's incredible how many things we've sold. And oddly enough, Eclipse glasses haven't sold as well. So if you haven't gotten your Eclipse glasses, uh, I can guarantee you we've got plenty. And I'm sure everybody else does. They're all scratching their heads thinking, why is this not selling? Um, but the solar filters, on the other hand, especially hydrogen alpha, oh, gosh, it's insane. I, I can't guarantee anybody is going to get anything. And last but not least is Seymour Solar um, Helios, which is their glass filter gives a similar view to how Thousand Oaks looks like. And the Astro Zap is practically the same if you have an Astro Zap filter. Um, for those of you who don't know, if you bought a Mead solar filter, it is actually the same as the Seymour Solar, so it looks identical in every shape and form. Next, <laughs> this is what um, is always interesting about the Mylar aluminum filter, and this is pretty similar to uh, solar wedges. And the great thing about what Alan's done is, is he sat down and gone through the time and the effort to do multiple exposures to show people what would happen in terms of the exposure, how it would react, and how much you want to see. And you can kind of get an idea here with one three thousand two hundredth of a second actually gives you probably the best view all the way up to two hundredth of a second using one of these filters, obviously. Um, you can kind of see this broad spectrum get brighter and brighter and brighter. Now, going back to the different types of filters, um, this is a calcium K filter specifically that you're looking at, and it gives a very, very different view of, we'll call it the surface. We're actually looking at the photosphere, which is part of the sun's atmosphere. So it's not technically the surface, but you know everybody wants to use that as a common phrase. So difference between calcium K and white light. So this is calcium K. And this is white light. So we can notice a huge difference here in some of the details uh, and some of the, I don't know, cool features, we'll call them, on the sun. Uh, these are the same, this is the sun, sun, uh, same sunspot. It was just taken at a different time because I had to take the thing out and put it back on. So that gives you an idea of some of those things. Now, what to expect from an eclipse? That's the <laughs> other thing. So those of you who did the annular eclipse kind of like me because i did it at the back of my store uh where i was working that's basically what we got and a lot of people don't realize this about the moon itself it's not as smooth as it is made out to be i mean in the grand scheme of things yes you know if you if you expanded ourselves to the size of you know some gigantic monster and the moon is the size of a marble, we'll say, you would never feel any difference when you actually touched it. It would be smooth as a cue ball to you. But in reality, there's all these little lumps and bumps behind it, which, oh, look at that, those ones right there, like little mountains and things like that. And what happens here is this, well, there's a phenomenon known as Bailey's beads that occurs during um, just before totality, and it occurs because the moon is not perfectly smooth. So obviously you don't get that during uh, an annual eclipse. So, but what I'm going to also do is uh, I'm going to show you some neat features um, in terms of processing as well. 
some close-up views of the uh, process images and you can see the coloration that i actually went for is very similar to how the old thousand oaks glass looked uh, again this was done with a herschel wedge <laughs> specifically i mean you can you can see that this is not a perfect circle there's like a big flat spot here and of course there's a bunch of sunspots hiding so we get the idea so now, most of you should know by now uh, the program that we use to stack is AutoStacker. Well, if you didn't know, AutoStacker 4 is out now. I just and, used it the other day. <clears throat> yeah, um, it's, it's still in beta, though, or beta, whichever way you want to pronounce it. Uh, so there are going to be some minor hiccups here and there. And let's um, pull out some files yeah let's do these so this is a uh, going to be some h alpha stuff i'm just going to grab a couple of frames here so one interesting feature that i've noticed or it's not a feature it's more of an accident the stabilization when you're doing um a disc has actually increased quite dramatically and what i've found here is, is if you do a full disc of the sun you can actually set this to planetary mode and when you actually have multiple frames in, uh, sorry, multiple video files inserted, you can actually stack it and it will be somewhat aligned ahead of time. So it's actually less stress for you to um, change the stacking so it actually fits on top of each other. I'll show you what I mean by that in just one second once this has done it. <clears throat> While I do that, I'm just going to quickly open up... Um, IMPPG in the background. A line image, that was the thing I was thinking of. So hopefully I should have a folder in here with a bunch of... The top, wasn't it? Um, I don't know where it whistled off to. There it is, ah, there 50. It is. <clears throat> so if I open these, very little movement but it is actually very well aligned already. So the idea behind this is, and it's not a mistake per se, because obviously this is for planetary. It only works when it's full disk like this. For doing image alignment, it's actually easier and faster for you to go through it in this particular way, as opposed to trying to get the software to do it. And you get this weird jittering effect where it's not quite perfect, especially if you do a very, very long time lapse. The, the way AutoStacker 4 uh, and even previous variations would work, when you do a full disk with the planet setting for image stabilization, it'll always find the center of your spheroid and keep it in the middle uh, so you don't have to try and stabilize it afterwards. And then, of course, everything else still applies. There's a couple of things here and there that have changed in this system. Uh, I'm still trying to learn all the ins and outs of it. So it's uh, it's been... It's been a fun learning experience. But yeah, not a lot different here. Very, very straightforward. It's exactly the same as you would use it. Uh, but yeah, definitely some improvements. And it runs a lot faster, I will say that. All right. So, like I said, this was going to be short. And I do want to open it up more for questions uh, to try and help everybody out as much as possible. Because, you know, we've all got questions, I guess. So you want to... Um, terminate the desktop sharing for a second uh yeah and let's open this up to early questions and answers because i kind of feel like you guys are just bursting with questions sometimes so i don't have a lot cozy. of questions at the moment but one thing i wouldn't mind addressing if you guys have questions now is the time to throw it out there but um, as Simon has mentioned, there's a lot of people buying hydrogen alpha and probably narrow band filters for the eclipse. Those are great options if you're going to be in an area where you're only getting a partial eclipse or even leading up to totality. But if you're going to be on the path of totality, um, those are all worthless once you get to totality because totality requires that the telescope is not filtered. Um, because you will not see the corona at that point. And that's where it comes down to impeccable timing. And that's why we had Gordon 
uh, on last month talking about the solar eclipse timer app, which can help you keep on tabs so you know when to take the filter off. And But the reason that you want to use a front mounted solar filter as opposed to say like a Herschel wedge, which Simon and I, if we had to pick a white light filter, a Herschel wedge is the pinnacle oh, filter always. for that. If you've got a refractor yeah, six inch or smaller, get a Herschel wedge. And I know a lot of people freak out about Herschel wedges. I'm sure you get it all the time too, where it's like, it's going to burn my telescope. It's not. Um, your lens will be fine. You're not going to melt anything. Um, and the Herschel wedges are designed to allow the heat to be dissipated in the right way. But you have to use it on the correct telescope. And that's only a refractor, usually six inch or smaller. Um, Lunt makes Herschel wedges. Um, Botter's got probably the highest in Herschel wedge available, but it's got a lot of modular capabilities. And then Starfield, which is the wedge I have now, which I'm actually really happy with. Um, I like it because it has the polarizer built into it. But yeah. Uh, but if you're going to be shooting totality, a front mounted filter is the way to go because what a front mounted filter lets you do is it lets you get focused. And then the only thing you have to do is take it off during totality and you don't have to refocus. That's why you want front mounted. A Herschel wedge is going to be cleaner, but it's going to drastically throw your focus off when you go to shoot totality. So don't bother using a Herschel wedge if your plan is to image totality. Just get a basic white light filter. It's just there to keep your camera safe and get focused until it's time to remove it only during totality. Now, if you're in the partial phases, use whatever you want. Um, let's see. Also this though. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> when you're doing, um, during totality. So here's the thing. I, I got to say this, make sure you are within the path of totality. And I don't mean, oh, I'm here in some random city in Texas, uh, but you're right on the edge. Okay. When you go above an aperture of greater than a hundred millimeters, it is still not considered a hundred percent safe to remove that filter unless you know you're fully in totality because even that small pin light uh during bailey's beads is enough to damage something it doesn't take long and i've you know played around with or toyed around with funny ideas of you know just messing around with scopes and stuff like that i've tested out from different pinholes like putting things in front of the scope allowing a tiny little pinhole to come through can i still ignite something uh short answer is, is yes you still can it doesn't take long uh, especially with apertures greater than 100 millimeters. And it's the same thing for a camera lens. Just because you have a camera lens doesn't change optics. And, you know, physics didn't stop working and then suddenly became photography physics. It is still the same principle. Your front of your camera lens is still the aperture. You can still measure that. Normally, it's indicated by the filter size, 77 millimeters, whatever. Um, you can get yourself a vague idea. So just keep that in mind. Make sure you are actually in totality before you even take that filter off. Yeah. Just a Yeah, word. I was going to use the Esprit 150 with a reducer, and I quickly changed my tune on that. So back to the Esprit <laughs> 100 um, at that point. Um, there is some questions here. Um, this is an off-the-topic one. Will OAG improve anything on Nebula or are better star shapes all you get? Uh, improve will an OAG improve what though? Are we talking guiding? Are we talking about your final image? Um, kind of be specific here because normally the reason why we would use an OAG in general is because our guide scope that we mount is going to have an issue known as differential flexure. Um, if you ever ask me about buying anything to do with guiding, I'll always tell you don't ever buy an external guide scope yeah. because. These systems with the three ring prongs are really antiquated. Uh, they're great for finder scopes for visual purposes, especially for lining up and doing quicker lining. But for guiding purposes, I personally am not a big fan of them because over time they shift ever so slightly. And I've come out before at night and when I first started doing this and my guide scope is sliding out and I'm like, oh, what happened here? Not thinking about, you know, cold contraction. Uh, and that's what's occurred here because you've got all parts of the you know the rings are made of different things this one's made of some cheap metal this one's made out of aluminum and that one's got plastic and that one's got delrin in it everything contracts at different rates 
So it slides out and starts shifting around and your guiding numbers are all over the place. And then you guys complain to all of us saying, oh, my guiding's terrible. Oh, I want my money back. So that's usually why I use an OAG. How does that really improve your image? Well, I mean, at the end of the day, if you're doing a really long exposure for five minutes, that's where it's improving it. What you don't want to do is set your guide corrections too high. Far often do I see people doing, what, 0.5 seconds, one second. And if your seeing is not good, what you're doing is you're putting in this error into your image. So you get your stars start to bloat like crazy. And then all your nebulas will start to look soft. So if you lower the time, uh, well, not lower, sorry, increase the time in between exposure to say something reasonable like five seconds, then you're less likely to get this problem occurring. And you're going to get a much, much sharper image because uh, it's based upon seeing. Yeah, you end up chasing the seeing with your guiding and then you assume that it's the mount's fault when it's actually right. just your guider sending so many relays to it. So. <clears throat> um, next question. Have you played with solar processor available in PixInsight now? <clears throat> um, short answer is, is no, I haven't because funny enough, I don't have PixInsight because I don't process DSOs all that often um, because obviously I have my own workflow that I have simplified on purpose. Um, but I have seen it. Um, it's very, very, very good. I just wish I could use PixInsight more often than not, but, you know, it is what it is. I have seen other people put it to uh, good use too, and it, it does work incredibly well. The only thing I will say this is you have to be careful with learning something. Don't learn somebody's workflow because the workflow will only work for that individual for that particular time. Try to learn what the tool does before you do anything else. Understand what deconvolution actually is. Understand the different types of deconvolution and why it does what it does. When you actually understand the software a bit better and the tools that you actually got, it makes your life for processing a lot easier. And it doesn't matter if it's uh, solar, it's, it's the same with anything. DSOs, comets, planets, you name it. If you understand what your tools do, then it will make your life simple. Yeah. <clears throat> um, where'd it go? Do you have any tips um, for capturing HDR images during a total solar eclipse to capture detailed shots of the corona? Okay, so there's two things that a lot of people, or at least I've been coming up with from, uh, sorry, other people that have been coming up with. Bracketing is the most common thing everybody says. There's different types of bracketing, just so you understand that. Again, this is one of these another mis, uh, misunderstood phrases. You can have focus bracketing, you can have exposure bracketing, and you can have the other one, which I've just slipped in my mind. I've forgotten what it was. doesn't matter, because <laughs> I don't need to know that one anyway. The exposure bracketing is basically taking multiple exposures and then combining them into one. And you can do the same thing, I believe, with ISO as well uh, and aperture because um, they're all dark types of bracketing and then depending on your camera it'll put it together or you have to do it in post so the answer is is do i have anything about hdr capturing the real answer is this it's kind of tricky to do hdr with an eclipse because you're dealing with two problems here you're dealing with too much light and not enough light to try and combine into one big image you are far better off actually capturing as much as possible during uh, totality for the actual corona itself keep in mind it does move okay you don't want to do a one minute exposure i mean if you could uh, yeah, that would be great but you want to get lots and lots of short exposures like two to three seconds even and the idea here is to be able to stack this to eliminate the noise so you're basically going for signal to noise ratio we want more signal than we want noise and we want to trash the rest of it hdr doesn't really help you in that point you're going to get an HDR image, but it will be just as noisy. And the aim of the game is to eliminate noise. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think a lot of this, when you see these really detailed images of the Corona, those are multiple shots that are finessed in post-processing very carefully. Um, so you really got to be an understanding of how to make those digital tools work in post-processing to get that to be smooth. <clears throat> Only thing you, um, is, I've actually tried to find, um, there's a group of guys, and I still haven't gotten in touch with them, 
that they've set up multiple cameras to speed up the data capture because let's face it most of you who are going out there uh and i will mention this now when you're going to an eclipse okay don't make your life complicated keep it simple okay at the end of the day if you've never seen an eclipse before in your life don't bring 16,000 cameras and 20 telescopes and 50 mounts and half your family over because you are going to miss it. You are literally going to be spending your time doing this and not doing that. Um, so, you know, keep that in the back of your mind. It's an experience. Don't get it overcomplicated. That said, I know a bunch of guys who are going complicated and the aim of their game is they've set up multiple cameras to capture the exact same thing in order to combine the amount of data to get, uh, together. You've got four minutes worth of totality, give or take a few seconds here and there, and you can only collect so much with one camera. The idea here is they're trying to use as many cameras as possible, all capturing the same thing. And because they're all from different cameras, well, the great thing is, is the readout noise is gonna be different from one camera to the other. So when they combine this data together, this should give one heck of a killer image. Uh, I'm twitching to see it because I really hope that they pull this off, this this group of people. Um, as far as I know, they're just using four cameras, um, like DSLR or mirrorless cameras. So again, I'm waiting for that picture to pop up, and I'm sure people are going to want to try and get copies of the data to try and tweak it out even more. But yeah, when you see it, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, let's see. Did that one. Any insider information when Lunt will start answering emails and requests? Um, I'm going to give you a short answer. Um, a lot of people think that these companies that produce products, especially in astronomy, are manned by massive teams of workers. Okay, I'm going to give you an example about my store. Just so you know, there are only two of us, okay, that work in the telescope department, myself and Victor, and just to make life even more miserable for Victor, I'm a part-timer. I'm only there two days a week. So you can imagine how crazy it gets sometimes just to get through to me. Now, how does that translate to Lunt? So depends who you want to talk to. If you're talking to support, well, the guy that does the support is also the guy that has to test the scopes and build the scopes. So the chance of him answering the phone right now is pretty slim, which means somebody else answers the phone, if at all. The other person, if you're doing from a sales standpoint, um, there's two of them. Again, you have to understand if everybody wants the same thing and there's only two people there, you can just imagine how crazy it's going to get. Um, we've been warning everybody months in advance, even since 2023. The 2024 April 8th solar eclipse is coming. If you haven't got your product, get your product now. If you've got questions, start asking them now. Because when it comes down to the crunch time, which is what? Ooh, less than three weeks, you're in big trouble because you can't get anything. Unless you want solar glasses, I've got loads. Yeah, or you're going to have to find a dealer who has what you want in stock, which you will. Good luck. Um, solar glasses. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, these specialized oh. lunt scopes take a long time to make they're all handmade um and they're all tested so you're getting a really nice quality piece of gear simon has a collection of his own solar filters i have a collection of my own solar filters um if you came to seoul you probably saw all of them um for and there's a cat <laughs> um but and if you come to texas we'll have a pretty large fleet of stuff available as well but we all got our equipment before the craze started so it's hard to i'll just be upfront about it. it's hard to give sympathy for people who wait till the last minute to order stuff like sorry but 2024 april 8th 2024 has been known for years um but also keep in mind that just because the eclipse is happening 2025 is the peak of solar max and that's where you're going to want the hydrogen filters for sure so you know it's it's coming so before i answer uh, this other question i'm just going to ask the person who wrote the question a question what is a good setting for a time lapse tell me what your focal length is uh because it's quite important yeah there's a lot of variables in that question yeah uh while we so wait I'll for wait his answer um 
Can the sun hurt the front lens on Tox? Tox use fluorite in the front uh, for some reason. Not every Takahashi uses their uh, fluorite ED element on the front, um, but the short answer is no. Um, this is a really common misconception with the Herschel wedge as well, is it's going to damage my lens. The light hitting the lens of your telescope is no different than the light hitting your skin. Like It's not focused. It's just sitting there. It's the same light that's hitting the side of the telescope. It's the same light hitting the ground. All of that. So unless your lens can get sunburnt, which it can't, um, no, it won't hurt it. Um, I have had people have issues with any telescope that is oil-spaced. Um, mm -hmm. The oil can have leaks over time, and my understanding is constant use for the sun can cause issues with oil spaced uh refractors but takahashi's uh are air spaced um sky watcher is air spaced um most companies are air spaced there's only a, i think a handful that are oil spaced nowadays um all of them are great refractors but for the sun you particularly want to have air spaced and if you're doing narrow band you can even have an acromat doesn't need to be anything fancy so um so no short answer no it won't hurt your telescope uh simon his focal length is 500 millimeters there you go okay <clears throat> so just to expand on the the lens aspect here and this is not just for a takahashi think of it like this i wear eyeglasses and i think a, a vast majority of people probably out there wear sunglasses and all that kind of stuff light passing through your glasses remember it's also focused on your eyes as long as i don't stare at it directly obviously it's not really going to affect anything I think what the real misconception that people are having here is, is how long can you actually leave a scope outside for staring at the sun is the better question. The reality is, is it's not IR that you should be worried about. It's not heat. It's uh, ultraviolet. And all of the scopes that I have that are for solar, especially the Evo Star 150, <coughs> If you bought one brand spanking new and looked down it to see all the flocking and the paint and all that stuff, it is black. Well, mine is not black any longer. I'm going to tell you that now. And that is because the ultraviolet light that comes through UVBA and UVB, whatever it is, uh, is basically just bleaching out the inside of the scope. So that's actually all that can happen. Okay. So again, if you have a dedicated solar scope or your system you want a dedicated focus and solely for solar, just be aware. The worst thing that can happen is that if you put your hands on the actual optical tube itself, the OTA, uh, as long as it doesn't burn your hands, you're fine. Most of the heat will sit on the focus aside anyway. So again, it's not going to burn up. It's not going to explode. It's not going to, you know, turn into a laser gun unless you take the filter out. And then you have right, a laser so, gun. So it's like, <laughs> I know it's great, right? Like, sorry, don't do that at home, please. Um, the best setting for the time lapse at 500 millimeters. So interestingly enough um let's just say you want to get a smooth animation of the moon going in front of the sun okay as you know what most people would want at 500 millimeters um i'm assuming you're on APS-C. okay the sun's going to be this is my frame here so hopefully you guys can see that the sun will be about that big okay how many how many seconds do i need to wait for the sun to move across now it's quite obvious but strangely enough it takes four minutes during totality and depending on how smooth your animation you want you actually want a gun for around about two to three seconds in between each frame for it to be noticeable if you want to create this ultra smooth super slow-mo and you can speed it up in post type scenario just continuous one after the other um if you're not too dis if you're not too bothered by that most people are aiming for 10 seconds uh, just to keep it down. So from the whole start of the entire thing from when it like first comes into contact, first contact, all the way to last contact, I guess, most people are gunning for 10 seconds in between. I personally would say if you've got the space, um, the drive capacity or the memory card size, just go for it. Do one second part to try and get that super smooth look because uh, you'll never know what you're going to capture. Now, in terms of how long you want to expose for, um, I can't wind this back, unfortunately, but if you look at that picture that I showed you, you want to try and do that at the 1,300, uh, sorry, 3,200th of a second exposure, which is quite far down there. Again, test this ahead of time to get the best exposure that you want 
not necessarily what you know everybody else is publishing alan dyer's information is a guide so you know what to expect and then the other thing i would say here is uh white balance pre-set your white balance take it off of auto white balance because during that point where the sun uh, sorry the moon comes in front of the sun white balance actually shifts constantly so you want to preset it if you want to set it to like 52,000 kelvin uh, sorry 5200 5200 kelvin geez i'm really losing it today um then you should be pretty much good for daylight balancing awesome um Real quick, going back, uh, the gentleman who said he can't get a hold of Lunt, uh, he's in the he's in Europe, so it's not about the eclipse. It's just about Lunt issues. Simon and I are really familiar with Lunt equipment. I've got three of them, and I've owned more than that, and Simon's played with pretty much all of them too. So if you have a Lunt question, just throw it in the chat. We'll see if we can actually answer it for you because, again, um, – Lunt is really busy right now, and it's a it's a small crew of people over there, and they're trying to bang as much stuff out for the people that are going to the eclipse as possible. Um, so trying to get a hold of them right now can be really difficult. So if you have a Lunt question, Simon and I could probably try to answer that for you because we're pretty well versed in these scopes. Again, Simon's had his fair share, and I've got three of them. Um, all of them are going to Texas, so you can come check them out. Um, but throw that in the chat. We'll see what we can do for you there. Uh, what is the worst that can happen to an APO over time? About to buy a used talk and wonder if coatings will be hurt and what it results in. You... Uh, I kind of already answered that. The worst that can happen over time is the insides getting bleached to a slightly grayish color. And that's, that's if you're using it gonna for constant use on the sun. Um, if it's been a scope that is basically used for night, Nothing. It's just an old scope. Unless they cleaned it wrong. I I have seen people attempt to clean anything. And you can damage the coatings. And you'll probably get micro scratches and stuff like that in the lens. Which honestly isn't the end of the world. Um, it's not pretty. But if you're going to do the flashlight test. Which is not a test. Um, flashlight tests are obnoxious. And it doesn't tell you anything about it. So... Don't call us up saying I did a flashlight test. Things get dusty. Use a blower bulb and get on with your day. So, thanks for calling. So, um, <clears throat> but yeah, it should be a, okay. a good one as well. So What's Eric that? actually says, uh, I'm not able uh, to get to totality, we'll, but we'll be imaging from a 90% site. If I'm using a bar and a white light filter and a DSLR, do I have any camera setting changes or will it be the same throughout? The answer is it will be the same throughout. Obviously, do not take the solar filter off at any point. Yeah. That's a really Nothing deep Nothing actually deep changes. But yeah, once um, you get out there, get focused, and then play with it before. You could actually go out today and try it. Whatever your settings are today is the exact same thing it'll be on that day. So that's the nice yep. thing about the partial and annular eclipses is you don't have to do anything special. You know what the funny thing is, actually, and I'm surprised nobody's asked this. Well, I guess it's more science related. I've had a handful of people ask me, do the settings change depending on what phase of the eclipse it is and the answer actually is is no because the illumination level of what comes from the sun is actually still exactly the same and a lot of people don't realize that the sun doesn't suddenly get darker just because the moon's in front of it it stays the same the mm. settings always stay the same so for a lot of people do not be tempted to start changing the settings. The only time you have a major setting change is during totality and you take the filter off and then you're trying to capture the corona. Incidentally, if there is any prominences, they will show up, believe it or not. And yeah. they're, they show up really well. In fact, if you have some of those uh, binoculars, again, please exercise extreme caution when doing this and you're looking through binoculars uh, you can actually see some of these problems visually, just like you would see in a hydrogen alpha. And a lot of people report that it looks pink. I saw them in 2017. My pictures have them in there. There wasn't big ones going on. I really hope there's oh, really? big ones because now we're in max. Yeah, we're so in this max. one's going to be really we're not interesting. Into max yet? We still got one more year to go before we stop. We we peak, but it hopefully stuff is going to go off and we're going to have an x class flare right during totality because i'll tell you now if an x or a, uh, an m class occurs during totality 
and you guys who are out there doing images of the corona you will see this happening you will actually see it in real time we won't so the problem is it's only four minutes long so it's kind of annoying you will see the initial bulging occurring for those four minutes assuming that it starts at that exact moment and i tell you now everybody <laughs> is going to be going berserks if that ever happens uh so yeah hopefully it does yeah we'll have to keep an eye on that so um we did that one what advice do you have for video i am thinking about doing video too i take 4k video on my sony fdr ax 100 camcorder <clears throat> point out the sun put the solar filter on don't touch it dead easy answer um it actually works really well you just need to have a lot of space because you are going to be recording non-stop basically for almost an hour and a half i think it is uh how do you track the sun and do a polar alignment during the day finally somebody asked a question that <clears throat> i can actually give a great answer to how do you do polar alignment during the daytime um is actually a really really good question the answer is is drift aligning okay and there's two parts to it to make your life simpler um i probably should have done a presentation on this because it's not exactly intuitive you need to know where you are on earth your latitude longitude and the number you're looking for is the one that says n or s depending on if you're in the southern hemisphere if you're in texas we're going to be doing n so it's the how much is the mount going to be raised up by okay so the answer is, is approximately 30 degrees if you're in dallas i think it is but just double check your gps coordinates because it will tell you set your mount exactly at that most of them have a little gauge on them if you've got a phone app with uh, an inclinometer and all that kind of stuff test it out make sure it says 30 degrees okay the other part of it here is is get your scope to point to north and then adjust for true north it's ever so slight it's not dead on north it's slightly off to one side okay so to the left we'll just call it that tell your mount to go to the sun assuming that you've got this roughly accurate the interesting thing here is is if you've got a relatively wide field of view, we'll say 500 millimeters, because we're going to go with the guy that came up with that question. If the sun shows up in the field of view, you believe it or not, you are very close to being polar aligned. The only thing you need to do is the minor adjustments, the, uh, the azimuth, the left and right rotation. If your sun drifts, okay, you're going to turn it one way and recenter the sun. Now, if the sun drifts really fast, you've gone the wrong way. Turn it back the other way. Make sure you keep recentering the sun when you make these adjustments. At some point, when you're only doing the azimuth, the sun will simply just stop moving, and you will not be able to perceive it. At that point, for all intent and purposes, you are pretty much polar aligned with the mount. And a lot of people don't realize this. Don't be fooled by just the mount. Deck also tracks at the same time. Deck has a tiny movement when you're doing solar tracking because it does not follow the same path as, as the star, so to speak. It slightly differs. So these two points do actually move. So that's actually how you do that. So again, you set your altitude as that, 30 degrees if you're in Texas somewhere, and you just set it to true north, and then just watch for the drift, and then just make the azimuth uh, adjustments accordingly. Uh, and yes, somebody said, uh, do you have to level the tripod? Yes, absolutely. Make sure everything is level. If you've got one of those little star adventurers uh the gti's for example they do have a little bubble mm -hmm. level on them so those are nice and neat if you're doing alt as on the other hand it doesn't matter if you've got one of those solar quests it really doesn't matter and i will say this about those people who own solar quests who just bought it yesterday give it time to do the alignment procedure um, because it's not instant turn it on let it do its thing and leave it alone it will find the sun it will track uh there's a lot of stuff going on let's see well the skywatcher solar yeah. quest mount for photography during totality yes uh we have tested the solar quest by covering up their sensors um i've done it for a half an hour it still tracks fine um there were some people that were saying that there was some weird tracking anomalies during the annular eclipse i have to imagine that's because it is going through a pinhole um on the sensor and the sensor's probably seeing a really weird ring, so it's probably freaking it out. Where a total solar eclipse, it, it, there will always be a point of light until there isn't 
and then it'll go back to a point of light. So we have covered it before just to check that a couple years ago. It worked fine for me. So I think you should be okay. <clears throat> oh, Simon, you've already talked to this uh, person about their lunt scope, apparently. So. <clears throat> oh, what is the problem? Uh, Simon and me talked on Discord about it. Upon further inspection, testing, and tips over experienced users and guys on cloudy nights, the scope will most likely have to be sent to lunt. Or whatever in charge of repairing issue that we spotted are too wide a band pass even if perfect tune and resetted um non-uniformity on the edelon it sounds like a blocker's tilted if it's not yeah, uniform possibly. it sounds like the the blocker's tilted <clears throat> uh you have to forgive me if i don't remember who you are I've talked talk to, to a, a lot, lot of people, people and it's yeah. been a lot lately. <clears throat> but yeah, if generally in a lunt scope, because I just had to work with this on my new 152, um, uh, if it's not uniform, especially if it's a single stack and it's not uniform, there's tilt somewhere where there shouldn't be tilt, and that's usually in the blocking filter. Um, so here's an interesting one for you because um i'm not gonna say too much about this other product for a second but what i found here is this to how to know that you're on band or you're trying to get your tuning right when you change your tuning and it doesn't matter if it's a tilt tune pressure tune whatever tune uh with exception of a solid edelon as in heating because the heating could be uneven that's a different story when you're actually tuning you'll see this weird shifting effect occur and the best way to explain it or to describe it here is is when you get a full disk image of the sun as long as you don't have shading on one side like it's bright on one side and darker on the other uh, and it's like more in the center you'll know you're roughly uh, on band and it's up to you to do those minor tweaks here and there do not be afraid to rotate your blocking filter if you ever took the blocking filter out and look at it uh, if you some people have a diagonal some people have straight through the very first part of it has a slight slant to it and it's not by accident it's not a mistake they didn't screw it up it's there on purpose uh it's there to eliminate newton rings or internal reflections okay that's why they're there the thing here is though somewhere else along the optical path there is also a tilt and what you don't want is for the tilts to be parallel to each other because then the light will go out like that and you'll get this really funky image. So you have to find a point where it kind of cancels each other out. And you just have to keep turning it round and round in circles until you find it. And at some point, you will suddenly notice that the um, the sphere is just perfectly illuminated. It's not shifted to one side and it's not shifted to another. Especially if you do it through imaging, it's really obvious when you're doing it through a camera visually. What will it look like to you is it looked like photosphere on one side and a little bit of hydrogen alpha on the other. Now, as you get it on band, it sweeps across until it hits the middle and then suddenly it looks perfect. Yeah, I've had to learn so, that yeah. with my, my new 152 double stack. And you, a lot of people um keep the let's say you're doing the double pressure tune systems like they do on the 80s on up a lot of people keep the pistons um in line with each other it's actually recommended you offset them um minor offset by about 120 degrees my double stack tuner is 120 degrees away from the front front of the lawn and that also makes it a heck of a lot easier to tune them so you're not mm -hmm. running your hand into the tuner. So don't be afraid to rotate the pressure tune of the double stack if you've got that going too. Um, but yeah, there is a question in here. Can I use a Canon 70-200 to lens to shoot the solar eclipse? Sure. It's a little wide, but sure. <clears throat> I will say this. If you're going to go with a 70-200, to um, the sun will be this big. Very again, tiny. there's my frame. It'll be this big, roughly. Okay. Uh, again, this is if you're on <laughs> APS-C. I would strongly suggest that you find a point of interest where you can see the ground. You may be better off shooting it at 70 millimeters, actually, so you can some see some kind of perspective, <laughs> uh, a tree, something to give a size. Because during totality. When it gets there and you're able to take the filter off, it's really awesome looking because the best part of it here is 
if you don't if you've never been to an eclipse it's actually more fun to see it and to see the experience of what happens around you okay pay attention to wildlife pay attention to the people around you because it's it's actually well documented people change when stuff like this occurs and it's almost like a spiritual thing and this is why i've been telling a lot of people who have never done an eclipse before don't bring a bunch of stuff literally bring your camera maybe a tripod and that is it enjoy this experience i keep telling people this over and over again once you've done this before and you've done your third and fourth eclipse yeah go crazy bring every camera bring every telescope you own under the sun how critical yeah. are tilt for solar for oh I'm going to assume that you're talking about uh, Newton rings or interference rings. Uh, how critical is it? Well, it's very critical if you want to get rid of them, uh, is the short answer. I don't actually like tilting my camera or using these uh, interference eliminators that tilt the camera in some description. I actually use something called an ADC, an atmospheric dispersion corrector, not for atmospheric dispersion correction, but for there's basically yeah, a prism Simon inside of like these things. Simon doesn't like to use these. So the, yeah, I don't like to use those things. Filters. So. so when you have an ADC, <clears throat> there's two pieces of glass that actually sit like this. This is quite an exaggerated thing. And when you turn them, they actually get rid of your uh, Newton rings, depending on how severe they are. Some people just put it in and say, oh, it doesn't work. Rotate we'll, we'll the damn thing, because you know you have to actually get the interference to go away. So Newton rings occur because you've got two parallel surfaces that are, oh, sorry, two optical parallel surfaces together, and you have to try and tilt them somehow to get rid of that effect because it's the light doing this between the two parallel sur surfaces. That's why they form. Yes, yeah, so you have to offset them. That's why Daystar, Lunt, Coronado, if you look really close at the systems, somewhere in there something is slightly tilted and i've had people like it's tilted that's how it's supposed to be you don't want them parallel um if using sharp cap there is a new eclipse sequence generator program to automate camera exposures during eclipse test that fully on your setup um sounds like a cool tool just make sure you've run it over and over and over again um, when using guys... an astro, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was gonna say, let me, let me, let me throw this one. If you guys want to simulate an eclipse, and I know this sounds dumb, um, find a lamppost and stand in front of it with your camera, and then just take a picture with the lamppost blocking the sun. It is practically, but you have to be quite a distance from the lamppost. It is virtually the same thing as you testing for an eclipse it, just to have something there. Basically, you're making yourself a, a chronograph, for lack of a better description. Is, is what that is. So if you do want to test it with your camera out in the street, just get in front of an object that's far away when, you know, and, and just take a picture and have it obscure. It's the same principle. And people wonder uh, why I don't care for the solar eclipse, by the way, because I'm trying to take pictures of the sun. The last thing I want is something to block the damn view. Yeah. Stupid moon. <laughs> Stupid moon. That's no moon. So. Um, got... Two minutes left. Uh, when using an Astrocam like a ZWO and Sharp Cap, what would be the best way to get white balance? <clears throat> oh, oh, yeah, that's a tough one with Sharp Cap. Um, <laughs> there really is no re easy way. Okay, if your exposure is set correctly, you're going to have on the histogram a bunch of lines going up. Okay, each one represents the color red, green, blue. You've only got two sliders that you can mess with. Green is always set where the neutral point is, and then your red and blue slide it until everything comes close and is merged together. It's not going to be dead on perfect, but that's the only way you can try and do white balancing on uh, using a histogram specifically. Just keep in mind, if you do that, what are you going to get? A white image. So just keep that in mind. If there is any type of tint of color occurring, it's just because your offset is slightly off. Remember, if the sun is a is a white, it's white. It's not going to be pink, green, yellow, or blue. Just use your just use common sense on that. But that's how you do white balancing in sharp cap. Get it so the peaks all come together, the red and the blue. Uh, to like deep interact sky with green. stacker is the same thing. When you stack at the end, you can drag the peaks to where they line over yeah. each other. 
Um, will Simon uh, be at Neak and Neve? No. <laughs> Too long of a drive. drive. Yeah, it's a long way. Um, the 2600 uh, ZWO is actually a really good uh, camera for full disc, I have found. Oh, okay. Sorry, Luca. Now I remember who you are now. Okay. Um, I, I've got to say this. If you're doing hydrogen alpha imaging, just in general, okay, try not to use one-shot color cameras, even if you set them to monochrome. There are two major problems that are occurring here. You've got the Bayer matrix, which causes other funky issues because the blue and the green pixels don't register anything, so it just registers noise. Even if you de -Bayer it afterwards, you get some really strange results. And then here's another one for you. Most cameras, when they're switched over to monochrome mode, are not true 16-bit, let alone 12-bit or whatever bit rate that they claim. They're actually closer to 8-bit. When you shoot images, even in monochrome, I always tell people, always shoot 16-bit. There are more shades of gray, regardless of what the camera can actually do, whether it be 12-bit or 14-bit. Some cameras are true 16-bits, but if you shoot in 8-bit, okay, your histogram will have this sawtooth jaggedy edge look to it. Well, those sawtooth jaggedy edges is basically no data, for lack of a better description. It just has to make it up as it goes along. So how does it do it? Well, we'll just smooth out that curve is how it does it. The common thing that people say, well, if I stack all these together, I get a 16-bit image. No, you don't. You still have a stack of 8-bit images. It does not equate to 16-bit. Shoot at 16-bit. Who cares about the frame rate at that point? Yeah. Yeah, I was messing with a 2600 mono um, on the 152 that I just got. Um, and this was my first light image with it. This is 16-bit. This is the full frame. It does have a 34-millimeter blocker inside of it, so it's got room. But you can see with the resolution of these cameras, you can dig way in there. Um when you're running 16 bit and these higher megapixel cam now i wouldn't choose this camera as a high speed high resolution zooming in on a target i would switch to the apollo m max or something else at that point but for full disc you're not asking a lot from it so that's the 152 um if you're going to the texas star party you can check it out there it'll be there but um last question last yep uh, then we got to shut it down <clears throat> It's, uh, do I have a guide? The answer is, is yes, I do actually have a guide, and it's featured on this YouTube channel. If you go, go back into the old live views, uh, sorry, live shows, if you look for the first um, solo one that I did was about what, a couple of months ago now, right? Yeah, you've been, this is the couple third time you've been on. Yeah, officially. it's the third time I've been on for, so, for solar. Go watch that video. It is uh, my workflow as well as me going through what the program does and how it does what it does. Now, remember what I said to you earlier about workflow. You're looking at my workflow, not learning about the software. Like I said, learn the software first. <laughs> Understand what the software does. So we'll just go from there. But yes, go watch that. And hey, hopefully you'll be on your way. Um, All right. Last little thing. Can I project uh, an image, a cardboard? What? Can you do solar projection without damaging the eyepiece? Yeah, I would use a cheap eyepiece, like a 25 or a 30 Plossel, um, something sacrificial. You could go on Amazon and buy one for 30 bucks. I would use that as your projection eyepiece. Don't go buy an Ethos or use an Ethos to do solar projection. Just go get yourself a Plossel or even something cheaper. But yeah, it should be, should be okay. If it's too close to the focus point, you'll know this really quickly because the cardboard will start smoking. Um, so... But yes. just, just be very careful with it. So, All right, everyone. We just blew through an hour. So, Simon, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, next week is just a Q&A session. So if you want to come back with any questions that you have about the sun, that will be our final big episode for asking us any questions directly. And then right after the next week uh, will be Fred Espinek, who's basically the master of eclipses. And then it's eclipse time. So um, we have two episodes left uh, next week. If you've got questions, please let us know. Um, you could even write into us if you want. Actually, that'd be kind of cool. If you have questions that come to mind, you can email them in info at skywatchusa.com and maybe we'll get a list together. Um, so you could shoot that over to us or just write them down and you can ask me next week. But uh, all right, Simon, thanks for hanging out.
Yeah, no problem. I was going to say, if you guys have <clears throat> um, a really good, nice, complicated question and you can give us time, we will try and put something together uh, ahead of time so there's something like a, a visual explanation of it. Kind of like the how do you do the, the drift alignment, polar alignment during the daytime. You know, we can definitely try and do something like that for you guys. Um, do you want to be on next week, Simon? As part of that Q&A uh, session? I can be as long as we've got these pre-done questions. So hey, well, if it's just a general If we Q &A, get a lot yeah, of questions. You know here anyway. Yeah, if we get a lot of questions, I'll I'll let Simon know. If we don't get much, it'll just be me. But yeah. All right, guys, we went way over today. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, clear skies. There's the cat. He's not too happy about it. <laughs> so it's like, I didn't agree to this. So um, have a great weekend. If you are in Tucson, by the way, this weekend is the Sabino Canyon astronomy event in uh, northern Tucson. Um, some of my uh, friends will be there. I wish I could be there. I just didn't work out this year. Um, but if you want something to do, there's some cool stuff happening at Sabino Canyon this weekend in Tucson. Um, other than that, have a great weekend. We will see you guys next Friday. Take care and see you later. Bye.